Hi, and welcome to the MVAC Lab. I'm research intern Cindy Kutchick. We very rarely find artifacts exactly as they were when they were discarded. And features are never in the same state as when they were first formed. Materials might decay in the soil as bacteria and animals consume them, or the freeze-thaw cycle and exposure to the elements might cause them to crack and break apart. Some items, such as stone tools, tend to preserve in the soils of the upper Midwest, whereas others, like plants and leather, survive only under special conditions. Understanding factors affecting preservation and taphonomy, processes that affect plant and animal remains, helps archaeologists to better contextualize what they find and figure out what might not have survived. Today, we're going to talk about some of those factors. Use the timestamps in the description box to jump to a specific section. Many natural factors affect the preservation of artifacts, items made or modified by people, and ecofacts, plant and animal remains from a human context. Moisture, temperature, and seasonal freezing and thawing in areas like the Midwest can have a tremendous impact. Geological processes, such as erosion, and chemistry-related factors, such as soil pH, how acidic or alkaline it is, play a role as well. And biological factors, from the activity of bacteria and fungi to plants and animals, also affect what we find at archaeological sites. Cultural practices impact what preserves too. Throughout human history, people have intentionally and unintentionally destroyed things they or other people left behind. In the Midwest, many indigenous sites and some historic Euro-American sites have been destroyed by development and other modern activities. Even for sites that remain, plowing, erosion, and other changes caused by different land use can affect preservation within sites. Given all these factors that affect preservation in the upper Midwest, let's now take a look at the types of artifacts and ecofacts that preserve long enough for archeologists to find. Keep in mind that some artifacts are made of multiple materials that break down in different ways or at different rates. Sometimes only part of an artifact remains and perhaps indirect evidence of the material that decayed. We'll touch on a few examples of this as we go along. Stone artifacts, which are durable and inorganic, tend to preserve well. We find many waste flakes from flint napping and tools such as bifaces, knives, projectile points, and pecked and ground hammer stones, monos, and axes. Ceramics are another artifact type we readily encounter. Well-fired clay can last for thousands of years. But late pre-contact Oneota pottery sherds that originally had shell temper might have only voids where the shell temper once was. The calcium-rich shell leached out as it was exposed to moisture and compounds in the soil. Acidic soils especially contribute to leaching. Leaching can also occur with limestone tempered sherds. Here, rectangular voids show where the limestone temper once was. Closer to the modern day, historic ceramics such as this whiteware plate, crocks, and this yellowware mixing bowl fragment preserve as well. Preservation of organic materials, such as soft tissue, plant material, animal bones, antler, or shell, is much more complex. Moderate to warm temperatures, moisture, and oxygen create favorable conditions for fungi and other microorganisms that break down organic materials. However, 
if conditions aren't as favorable to microorganisms, decomposition of organic materials can slow down or nearly stop. Very dry conditions, like those in some Midwestern caves, can foster preservation of even wood or leather, like this torch and this moccasin from a dry cave in Western Wisconsin that's also highlighted in one of our display cases here at the lab. In other areas of the world, very cold conditions, like the permafrost in Siberia, can preserve even soft tissue for thousands of years. Water saturation and lack of oxygen can also help preserve materials, such as Denmark's famous bog bodies or ancient dugout canoes preserved underwater in the Midwest. Here at the lab, we have the partial skull of an extinct form of bison that was found buried in blue-gray clay beneath six feet of peat. Sometimes organic materials are physically protected or preserved through a chemical reaction with another material. Contact with copper can help to preserve organic materials, including shell, bone, and plant materials, because the copper salts can kill biological agents that cause decomposition. Other thongs or fiber twine, for example, are sometimes found preserved within copper beads. Like these bits of leather preserved with copper beads from a late pre-contact Oneota agricultural site near La Crosse. Bone or shell fragments too may be preserved if they were in contact with copper tools or copper jewelry. In addition, mussel shell, shell tempered pottery, or alkaline rocks, such as limestone or dolomite, can help preserve bone by reducing acidity in the soil. Soft tissue of animals tends to decompose fairly quickly under most circumstances. And in the Midwest, it's only found at archaeological sites under very unusual conditions such as the dry cave moccasin mentioned earlier. We have modern examples of what work tides could have looked like in the past here on display, but we wouldn't expect to find them like this at a site. However, stone and bone tools can be examined for wear patterns that show they were worked on a particular material, like a hide, or that indicate that non-working edges were ground down, smoothed, or worn in an area that was lashed to a shaft or handle with sinew. Our modern bison sapula hoe provides an example of a possible lashing pattern based on the wear we see on hoes from archaeological sites. Bone, antler, and turtle shell tend to preserve better than softer tissue, though they're vulnerable to decomposition too. Small and thin bones such as those from small mammals, birds, and fish, and juvenile bones that are smaller and still growing are not as likely to survive as larger, denser ones. Animal bones weather away and exfoliate under UV light in the open air. And when buried, soil pH and the freeze-thaw cycle can make a big difference in their preservation. In the upper Midwest, many soils in the Northwoods, for example, are fairly shallow and acidic, and bone preservation there is often poor. Bone preservation in other areas of the Midwest can vary tremendously, sometimes even within the same site. In some soils on the lacrosse terraces, animal remains are sometimes so well preserved that fish ribs several hundred years old are still flexible and fish scales are abundant. Animal bones and antler can show evidence that humans butchered them, used them as tools, or worked them into decorative items such as beads. We might see nicks, cuts, grooves, smoothing, or polish that show people modified them. Bones from butchered animals may show cut marks from stone tools, or a straight cut with striations from a more recent metal saw. 
people broke open and cooked bones from mammals such as deer to extract the marrow within. And we might find the discarded shards of broken bone that resulted. Bones from animals that people processed for food are sometimes burnt. In bones exposed to very high heat, the organic carbon burns away and the bone becomes calcined, ranging in color from blue-gray to white. It's important to differentiate human impacts, such as the ones just covered, from animal ones to figure out what activities are represented in animal bones. Bones are often scavenged by animals from dogs and larger carnivores like wolves to small rodents and other animals. Animal scavenging often leaves characteristic marks, and careful analysis can distinguish these from the V-shaped cut marks of metal knives and the U-shaped cuts of stone tools. Rodents gnaw on hard outer bone to keep their constantly growing front teeth from getting too long. Rodent gnawing typically leaves broad scrapes or grooves, sometimes in parallel pairs. Rodents tend to stop at the spongy inner bone because it's so soft. From there, weathering can have a greater effect on the bone. Rodents and other burrowing animals can also impact deposits with their digging, including dislodging artifacts from their original context and leaving burrows or runs through archeological features. Dogs and larger carnivores can crush smaller bones and gnaw larger ones, particularly on the ends. As dog owners know, Carnivores chew on antlers as well. Certain animals target the unfused epiphyses of younger animals, where the bone is still growing. Their teeth produce compression pits or punctures, scrapes, and gashes. And smaller carnivores leave scoring marks that tend to be broader and more random than metal or stone cuts made by humans. And more than teeth can leave their trace on scavenged bone. If bone fragments are ingested and pass through the digestive system, stomach acids leave the bone more rounded and change the surface. In the Midwest, we also find freshwater mussel shells and very rarely marine shells that were traded or brought into the region, for example, as beads. Mussel shells could have been discarded after the meat within was harvested, or the shells could have been used as tools and ornaments, or fired and crushed for use as tempering clay. Shell is rarely scavenged by animals, but moisture conditions, freezing and thawing, and acidic soil can contribute to its breakdown. Sometimes, shell at Midwestern archeological sites is fragile and powdery, or it disappears altogether. In other cases, it's so well-preserved that the outside still has its papery skin, or periostracum, and the inside of well-preserved shell sometimes still has its mother of pearl-like luster. Plant materials, such as seeds, corn kernels, nutshell, and wood, and artifacts made from plants, like cordage and thatch, degrade fairly quickly in upper Midwest soils. But they can last longer if they're charred, like these examples. When plant materials from Midwestern archeological sites are analyzed, most uncharred remains, such as rootlets and seeds, are assumed to be modern. Some seeds, 
such as the hard-shelled seeds of hackberry trees, sometimes preserve uncharred. And we might find desiccated seeds at a historic site. We can find indirect evidence of plant use as well. For instance, cord impressions in pottery can provide clues as to the type of cordage used and how it was made. Metal artifacts, such as copper projectile points, fish hooks, and other objects made by indigenous peoples, and later historic copper, bronze, and iron artifacts, such as nails, belt buckles, lamp bases, and clamming hooks, corrode and can be incredibly fragile and fragmentary when found in the field. For example, this folded piece of copper from a late pre-contact Oneota agricultural site has corroded over time. Eventually, only small flecks of material, like this copper from a site in Jackson County, Wisconsin, or a telltale stain in the soil may remain. Sometimes, however, metal can last hundreds of years or more, depending on its composition and the preservation conditions. Glass, such as bottles, window glass, and even small beads, tends to preserve, even if in pieces large and small. Chemical components in the glass and exposure to sunlight can cause the glass to have a certain tint or patina. On the small side, residues that survive on artifacts provide insight into resource use through the traces of the processed material that remain. Examples include charred organic residues on pottery and lipids or fats on stone tools. These can be studied to determine if they came from plants or animals, and in certain cases can narrow down the type of flora or fauna represented. Rock art survives on cave walls and cliff faces across Wisconsin. Our collection of rock art replicas allows visitors to view the designs indigenous people created long ago without damaging the real thing. Rock art can be long lasting, but it isn't permanent. Paintings and carvings fade and weather away with time and exposure to the elements. Rain, running water, even increased moisture from the breath of visitors, as well as living organisms such as moss and lichen can wear them down. Vandalism is yet another threat. Recording rock art through photos, drawings, notes, and maps in consultation with tribal experts helps to document these fragile and irreplaceable drawings. In rare cases, actual pieces of rock art are preserved indoors. We have several rock art fragments here at the lab that were once part of a rock face that included depictions of geese. The rock face weathered, fell, and shattered, but fragments were saved and recorded. Some were even put in a display box for use in public outreach. Moisture, soil acidity, gnawing rodents, these and other factors affect artifacts after they're discarded or left behind and they affect the preservation of different materials in varying ways. It's important for us to have a handle on what does and doesn't preserve, so we better understand what information we have and what might be missing as we construct and work to refine a picture of life in the past. For more information, see the description box. And to further explore archeological topics, find links to MVAC social media and view and subscribe to our monthly e-news check out the MVAC website. 
You can also donate online to support MVEC's work, including our videos. Thanks for watching.